Hallelujah. You might as well open back up to Matthew 20. I, I thought the Lord did a masterful job of delivering a lot of information in a short amount of time this morning. And I loved how it dovetailed with the message he brought through Mark, which I thought was perfect, the mind of Christ for right now. And uh, I, I'm just so amazed that he would all of a sudden, without any warning, start bringing forth teaching again, which on kingdom finances at this time, which I didn't anticipate. He didn't tell me it was coming. But I see what's happening even as I hear it come through my own voice. He's mingling it now. I don't... Let's say merging it uh, with so much of the born again trail and and the things that we've learned uh, this way. And uh, I know the revival uh, of finances. It's hard to get a good word for that. Kingdom finances, a revival of finances, supernatural finances, and I don't mean money trees. <laughs> I don't mean it like that. But I mean we're. In the same way that no minister can put on a leg on a person that's missing a leg. You can't do it without the Holy Ghost. You can't do it without God. The gospel entrepreneurs that he's raising up in these last days, and that's just part of it, because not, not all of you are called to business, but more of you are called to steward finances than are called to bring in the finances. You've got to have just as pure a heart. He's already had one Judas. He doesn't need any more. Doesn't need a bunch of people dipping into the bag. Judas was not an entrepreneur. He wasn't. He was a steward. But he was an unfaithful steward. Well, God's going to have people, he's going to have faithful stewards in these last days. Once more, I'll tell you, the money to them will be no different at all than a, than a wrench to a good mechanic. In the same way that the mechanic, he doesn't worship the wrench, he doesn't covet the wrench, he doesn't bow down to the wrench. <laughs> He considers the wrench a tool that he needs in order to do his, his job. Money will be just like that to these people. They won't bow down to it. They won't covet it. They won't worship it. But it will be a tool in their hand for the furtherance of the gospel. In exactly the same way that a wrench is a tool in the hand of a mechanic to accomplish his work. Well, purity of motives, purity of heart is essential. And I hope you saw in that message today, in that you can't commingle law and grace because the, the heart that is motivated by the one is it, that same thing doesn't motivate the heart of the other. I remember when money was my motivator. It was. I mean, <laughs> dangle money, I follow that. <laughs> oh, dangle more money over here, I quit this job, I'm going to go that way, you know. And, and uh, I remember when money was my motivator and it took him a long time. Took him quite a while to I, to. I started to say to drive that out. I hope it's. I hope all of it's driven out. Probably it isn't. I don't want to be like that preacher one time that he was standing right here. He said, "Now God, on a scale of one to a hundred of maturity, where do you think I am?" He said in his own mind he was trying to be humble, so he was thinking about sixty percent. He said, suddenly a thermometer appeared back here on this back wall, zero to a hundred, and a light started blinking two inches off the floor. <laughs> well, all I know is, is I'm, I'm much different in my motivation than I used to be. I can tell you that. I know it, uh, the same things that used to motivate me do not motivate me now. But still yet, see, none of us, I haven't walked with billions yet. You know, I haven't, I haven't proven myself yet. So we'll find out, won't we? Everyone say, yes, we will. <laughs> wouldn't you be stunned? Maybe some of you wouldn't. But wouldn't you be stunned if all of a sudden the Holy Ghost says, well, you've been begging me and begging me about your calling all these years. I'm finally going to tell you. You're going to steward $18 billion for the kingdom of God. <laughs> we'll find out if you're there next Sunday. <laughs> We'll find out. Well, this morning then, we went through, uh, starting way back in uh, Matthew, where did we start? 1916, about the rich young ruler, all the way through Matthew 20, down through verse 29. 
And Jesus really, he laid it out in, in such precise detail what it was about the rich young ruler whom God loved. This man, he, he loved God, he served God in the covenant that he had, which was, you keep the law and I'll bless you. you. If you don't, you won't be blessed. Well, this man had done his best to keep the law from his youth. He loved God. He was doing his best to serve God. But under that covenant, you've got to remember, the law was how God dealt with the spiritually dead people. I had a little mini vision since this morning. You know, your own teachings rolled through you, you know. And Y'all remember when, I, I don't know how many of you were here, but the day that Alan Taylor stood up there, and then Mike Banks stood right behind him. And, and it, you know, Alan was, since you, when you get to do the preaching, you get to be the spirit man. So <laughs> He was the spirit, and Alan was the flesh. You remember? No. Uh, Mike, Mike Banks was the flesh. So he would say all kinds of good things, you know. Now, your spirit man, he understands God, you know. And your, your flesh man, he's the guy of the world. He, he understands the things of the world. He knows the things of the world. He, he, under, he, he really likes the law in a way because at least he can comprehend the law. You know, do it and you get a whipping. <laughs> you, know, you know, do good. He says, but the, we're to live by the spirit. Well, I saw that same little vision again and I saw that rich young ruler. But when I saw that little mini vision... What you got to remember about the rich young ruler, there was only a Mike Banks standing there. See, he didn't have the new nature. He wasn't born again yet. So you're, it's God dealing, if you'll allow me, with the Mike Banks guy, or let's say around the world, they don't know what, you know. It's God dealing with a spiritually dead man. And his mind and his nature agrees with the flesh. He's a man of the world. He's an Adamite, child of Adam. It's mine, I keep it. <laughs> it's the nature that we're all born with, you know. <laughs> and so God's dealing with, with a man who has no new nature. See that? We're so blessed that we have the Alan Taylor, that we have the new nature to overpower the desires of the flesh. But that rich young ruler, he didn't have one. He just... So he's doing his best to please God, but his whole understanding of serving God... Well, if I serve God, he will bless me. So the motivation, I mean, it's a master stroke of genius. How are you going to deal with the spiritually dead people? Well, how do you deal with your children? When you're trying to train them, and they're pretty much all selfish, and they're little. And clean the room is not part of their universe. I mean, <laughs> what? why would a person want to do something like that, you know? And, and you're... <laughs> Well, you do exactly the same thing. You start offering them blessing and cursing or, you know, if you clean your room. Here comes the law. Clean your room. And if you do, it'll be well with you. And if you don't, it's not going to be so well. Well, God had to do exactly that same thing. But now, and I hope you caught that little part, and I had to go by it pretty quick today. This was so cute today that I saw this. You remember when Peter asked the question, what are we going to get out of it? Isn't that the perfect question for a spiritually dead man? I mean, you know, of course. So, in the course of that, he says, well, you twelve are going to rule with me on the twelve thrones in the regeneration. So, they heard that part. Then he goes through that whole parable about the vineyard, exposing the motivations of the heart. They didn't catch that at all. <laughs> After that, he tells them, uh, I'm going to be killed, uh, I'm going to be crucified, I'm going to die. They didn't catch that part at all. What part did they remember? We're going to sit on twelve thrones. <laughs> That's the part. Why? That's the nature that they have. Now, they love God. It's the rich young ruler loved God. These have done better than him. They did forsake their businesses, but you can tell it's still on their mind. What are we going to get out of it? Now, what's really scary about all this is that the motivation that's being given on Christian TV, you just check it for yourself. Well, really, I'd rather you not. <laughs> I mean, you can't turn on... Maybe there's one out there, but... I haven't found any yet or near the end somewhere. If it's going to boil down to this. If you give, you will be blessed. It's going to be boiled down to that. If you give, you will be blessed. Now, whatever method that they use to get there, you know, Matthew 21, 5, for those that send in an offering of $21.50, or those that send in an offering of $215, some of you really want to be blessed, $2,150, you know. Or whatever other hocus pocus. <laughs> and what's sad is they give by the millions. 
scary. And they're really doing exactly the same thing. And the only reason you can fall for that, you're not going to like this part. <laughs> Mike Banks, the flesh guy, is still bigger than the spirit guy. And you're, there's a handle, a big, big handle on the back of you called money. <laughs> or called good <laughs> blessings. And the devil can still manipulate you with it. I thank God for the day we found this church. This is the only place I've ever heard any message where a person on purpose can start allowing the Holy Ghost to deal with those handles. See, trying doesn't make you different. Have you noticed that? I love, I love Dave's pie analogy. Don't you all remember the pie analogy? It's that time of year where we talk about fasting, you know. So this guy's going to fast, and he does pretty good for maybe a week. But on the 10th day, Pastor Dave gets a phone call, and it's, it's the owner of the local pie shop, the local bakery. He said, this man broke through our front glass window. He, 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 broke, he ate everything in the front cases. He ate through our refrigerator door. <laughs> he's sitting back there now just devouring pies, and he's mumbling your name, Pastor. said, well, what, what, what happened there? Well, you came to, the end, came to the end of your mental ability. Your, you came to the end of you and your, your ability to control you. And what you really are came back out again. Well, I don't know of any other message but this one where you can change what you are. It's not hard to love when that's what you are. It's not, it's not hard to give when that's... It's not hard to give when you love that person more than you love yourself. Okay. Well, how does that happen? How, how can you possibly get there? Well, the, uh, I want to pick it up right at the end of that teaching. I had to do it a little quick, and then we're going to go one other place and look at it. <clears throat> Starting in verse 25 of Matthew 20. I don't know where I told you to turn. I hope that's close. Matthew 20, 25. He said, but Jesus called, unto, Jesus called them unto him and said, You know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them. And they that are great, or you could say those that are first, those that are chief, they exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you. Whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, and there that's the word protos, it means first. It's the same word that he used, those, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. Protos, whoever would be first, let him be your servant, and the word here is slave. And even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for many. I have a series back there called uh, The Serving Son. This passage and uh, Luke 15, 1 through 17, 10 is, where that, uh, is what birthed that series. Because I never could really make sense out of any of this. I mean, okay, I the way up is the way down. Uh, if I want to be great in the kingdom, I've got to become a servant, you know. And that's not really the natural course of things. That's what Jesus said here. He said, normally you scratch, you claw, you fight your way to the top, and then you have authority. But in the kingdom, it's not that way. And I never could really get it until I finally saw Jesus. Now, wait a minute. He is the son. He is already <laughs> the first. Uh, he already had it made. Uh, and yet he is the son that we see in Luke 15, 1, out amongst the sinners. What's his motivation? Does he think he's, God's going to reward him with finances? Does he think this is going to end with a big earthly mansion and a swimming pool and Bentley cars or no, Bentley camels? <laughs> What's his heart motivation? Why is he out there doing that and suffering persecution everywhere he goes? And I finally saw it. I said, this is the son who serves. And that's the pattern for us. Part of, that, part of the reason we don't think like that is religion keeps having us scratch and claw for things that are already ours. <laughs> we don't 
We don't think like sons. We don't act like sons. We don't pray like, like we have access to all of God's wealth. We don't, we don't think like he thought. And so the, the old familiar verses were rolling through me. Be you not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Don't walk like the other Gentiles walk. Why? You're not like the other Gentiles. You're a creature from another world. You're, you've already made it. You're already an heir. But you'll not be heir if you go back under the law. We saw that in Galatians. So what he's really telling them, he says, that's why he gives himself as the ultimate example at the end of this teaching. He says, I didn't come to lord it over you. Not really. He didn't come to become something like an earthly king. He said, I come to give my life. I come to be the ultimate servant. I come to lay down my life for all of mankind and even those that are determined to kill me. I'm giving my life for them. There's your ultimate, <coughs> excuse me, there's your ultimate example of first in the kingdom because he gave his life. Does that remind you of, of a verse? He who, he who seeks to save his own life will lose it. But he that loses his life for my sake in the kingdom, he'll find it. God, you have to allow God, we, you, we have to allow God to do such a work in our heart that the motivation in us is precisely the same as the motivation that was in him. Where we, we are the sons. Now, I'm, you women, we've been through this before. You know, that in, in Christ Jesus, there's neither male nor female. You know, I'm as much Eve as you are. The whole church is Eve. Men, hairy legs and all, we're Eve. Get over yourself. Okay? But women, you have to get over yourself too. In the kingdom, you're an heir. You're a son. What I mean by that, you're an inheritor. You have a, an inheritance. Same as any, any male. So, we have to start thinking like that. And you can't think like that and be boxed in in religion. It just can't happen, see? Well, go over to Luke 15, just for a moment. No, actually Luke 14, I'm sorry. This is the other passage where Dave teaches about true exaltation in the kingdom. True exaltation in the kingdom has everything to do with the motivation of your heart. That's why the rich young ruler could not really follow Jesus into the new covenant without being born again. He just couldn't do it. Okay, now, for us, let's start in Luke 14, 7. It says, He put forth a parable to those which were bidden when he marked how they chose out the, how they chose out the chief rooms. You know, that's, that goes on in every company I've ever been in, every every corporation I've ever worked for, every major church you'll ever be in. Even here, people during conferences, some of them will they'll try to get in to see Dave. You know, they just, and it's not like, and I don't mean it in a, in a good way. What I mean is they've got a ministry. And if they can just, you know, get Dave's stamp of approval or, you know, if Dave would start passing out their card or something, they're, they're seeing him more as a stepping stone than who he really is, Okay. Notice how they chose out the chief rooms. They want to be some they want to be seen as being chief, being important. That is so the exact opposite of how you get exalted in the kingdom of God. See? So he, he 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 it says when he marked how they chose out the chief rooms, he said unto them, When thou art bidden of any man to a wedding, sit not down in the highest room, lest a more honorable man than thou be bidden of him. And then he that bade thee, and, and him come and say to thee, Give this man place. And then thou begin with shame to take the lowest room. But when thou art bidden, go and sit down in the lowest room. That when he that bade thee cometh, he may say unto thee, Friend, go up higher. Then shalt thou have worship in the presence of them that sit at meat with thee. 
For whosoever exalts himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. How in the world... Well, well first off, you can plainly see that the, the key is to take the lowest room. Well, how in the natural do you do that, see? How did in the natural do you do that? When Alan Taylor came, he says all the time, you know, well, he'd, he'd really been in ministry, even though he's a pretty young fella, he'd been in ministry a long time already. And, and uh, you know, he'd hobnobbed with lots and lots of the major ministries in the United States. And I'm sure if he'd, uh, you know, he could have started building, a, you know, like anybody else, he could have started building a, his empire. <laughs> well, when he got here, you know, he's a, harness me up, you know, he's, he's ready to do something. He wasn't really looking, I don't think, to be exalted, but his, you know, trying to find his place, he came to me wanting to, you know, be his tutor. I said, I am not your tutor. <laughs> you didn't come here to have me as your tutor. Nobody came here to have me as your tutor. My tutoring is the messages. Now, what you need is the Holy Ghost as your tutor. You need to mark out... Now, here's how you take the lowest room. Go and... Like, how did Dave say it in the old days? Epoxy your britches. <laughs> we got some old timers here. Epoxy your britches to one of these chairs and begin to pray in other tongues. That's how you take the lowest room. There's no glory in it. Have you all noticed? People don't come and throw rose petals. <laughs> People don't... You know, they don't... There's no, there's no band, no trumpet. Not on the, nobody's asking you to be on TV and tell him how many hours you prayed today. I mean, you talk about a no-glory thing, talking, taking the lowest room. And you don't have to come in epoxy your britches. I couldn't do that at the time. I was a long-haul truck driver, gone most of the time. But I was in a job where I could, I could begin to pray. And everybody can begin to pray. See, that's the thing. Jesus made it universal. I don't care what you're doing, you can get them lips to moving and pray pretty silently under your breath. You can take the lowest room anytime you want to, and that's really the way you do it. Fasting is part of taking the lowest room when you don't blow a trumpet. <laughs> dun, da, 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 da. Well, actually, it was blow a trumpet giving your alms. That's right. You have, I'm about to give. Everybody come and look. Somebody call CBS. Hallelujah. I'm about to give. Now he says, when you give, when you pray, and when you fast, do not do it to be seen of men. See, to be seen of men, again, is ta that's taking the chief room. You can do religious things and still be taking the chief room with the motivation of your heart. See? He says, no, when you do those things, do them secretly. Just you and your father, only you and he needs to know. Now, now Sue says she needs to know. <laughs> well, she does, because... If I don't tell her ahead of time, and I'm going to fast tomorrow, and she labored for six hours making me a chicken dinner, she says, I would like it if you told me. <laughs> but you're not doing it again for glory's sake, see, you know. Those are the ways that you take the lowest room. And what begins to happen is a transformation in your own heart. Trust me when I tell you the Holy Ghost is good at what he does. Now, he is good at removing handles. He really is. He's good at... The, he, he's better than you are bad. <laughs> you think you're a hopeless case, and he says, just turn yourself over to me. I don't believe in hopeless cases. That's good preaching right there. I like... See, I'm, I'm hearing that myself. That's good. <laughs> he doesn't believe in hopeless cases. I used to read, come on, this is too long for us to do it all tonight, it's great, but come on down to verse 25, those are the verses that, that just kill you dead. <laughs> well, they all kill you dead. <clears throat> verse 20, well, we'll start in verse 26, of Luke 14. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters... Yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Now, see, we can't really... I, I jumped over there, and you really can't. Because by itself, you have a hard time with that verse, don't you? Back up just a little bit. Verse 16. Then he said unto them, A certain man made a great supper, and bade many, and he sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. 
And they all, with one consent, began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I bought five yokes of ox, five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. And another one said, I have married a wife. Well, obviously, he can't pray. <laughs> you notice he doesn't even give any other, any other reason than that. He just says, well, I married a wife. I can't come. <laughs> reason Jesus says this down here <laughs> verse 26 it's n none of that's going to fly basically what they're saying is I'm too busy to take that lowest room and in the context it's pray fast do all the things that we talk about doing I well I'm too busy I'm in business I I, I, I bought some I'm a real estate agent I bought some land I I have oxen you know I have a I'm a teamster today it'd be uh, I have trucks or something and and I can't pray and the other one well I'm I'm married I obviously can't pray you know <laughs> you must have a honeydew list. Anyway. <laughs> well, so that's why Jesus is saying down here, and, and hate, you've got to understand, is a relative term, because we've got lots of scripture where he says, honor your mother and your father, and love your wife, and all of that. So you've got to leave all that in there. What he's really saying is, relative to your love for me. Compared to that kind of love, it's almost like hate. Because you cannot put anything on this earth above your calling. Little different. Let's say it a little different than that because people run off with that. Let's say it different. You can't put anything in this earth above your necessity for transformation. That's better, isn't it? Because we have a lot of untransformed people with ministries. <laughs> How do I know that? Click. Click. Yeah. <laughs> or nowadays click hmm. so verse 27 well so verse 26 is really just saying look if, if you love your family more than me you're not ever going to make it I mean if the devil finds that out you'll be running around serving your family your whole life you'll never find time to pray the devil will make sure of alright what about this one verse 27 whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me. He, he can't be my disciple. Well, the cross is, is multiple in my mind here. The cross, part of it, is your flesh. Dealing with your flesh all the time. See, if you don't, if, 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 if you're like uh, Gary, <laughs> and you only fast your left ear. <laughs> no. <laughs> if you don't ever, see, my flesh always, always, always thinks a football game is more important than prayer. It always does. It always has. Now, I'm not against watching a football game. But if I start, if, if I spend years letting my flesh tell me that this is more important than prayer and that's more important than fasting and that over there is more important than getting in the Word, ten years go by and you go, wasn't I going to pray? That, that reminds me of uh, Mark's message this morning. You know, the tide just keeps that, that current, just keeps pulling you and pulling you and pretty soon you're out there and you go, how did I get here? Day by day, wrong decision by wrong decision, little by little. You didn't really intend to do it, but it just happened. How many of you know God's got mercy for backsliders? Thank God for that. Hallelujah. But the other part of that, bear his cross and come after me. See, the cross was not only where the flesh died, but the cross, in, in Jesus' case, that was his assignment from the Father. Now, you're not called to be the spotless lamb slain. <laughs> From the foundation of the world. There's only one qualified for that. But that cross is also representative of your calling. And most likely your flesh is not going to be real crazy about your calling. You know. But he's going. And if you're going to follow me. Y'all do know he prayed. Father if it be possible let this cup pass from me. It wasn't easy. But his love of the father overrode anything like that in him. Not my will. Not my will. Meaning he had a will. <laughs> Not my will, but thine be done. So the same way he had to endure his cross, you're going to have to endure your cross. And that includes your calling and the persecution that will come with it. Okay, so here verse 28 he says, 
For which of you, intending to build a tower, sits not down first and counts the cost, whether he has sufficient to finish it, lest haply, after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going to make war against another king, sitteth not down first and consults whether he be able with ten thousand to meet him that cometh against him with twenty thousand. Or else while the other is yet a great way off, he sends an ambassage and desires conditions of peace. So likewise, now at the end of all that, he says, So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsakes not all that he has. Does that sound familiar from this morning's message? What did he tell the rich young rulers? See, people say all the time, he doesn't say that to everybody. Yeah, he does. Yeah, he does, too. He says it right here. Whosoever he be of you. Now, everyone look around somebody and say, I'm a whosoever. Now say, you're a whosoever. Whosoever he be of you that forsakes not all that he hath. He can't be my disciple. Let's say it a little different way. You'll never be like him. You'll never be like him. Now, it doesn't mean that he is actually giving every person a command to go sell everything they have. But in your heart, you cannot be owner of that. You are bought with a price, my friend. Your life is not your own. You've been bought with a price. Do you think, and here, let's go back right back to the son for an example. Let's go back to him, he himself. What part of anything in Jesus' heart did he reserve for himself that the father did not have access to? Maybe his sandals. I love these sandals. Father, I'll serve you. I'll do anything you ask me. But as long as I can keep these sandals, these sandals are mine. It's mine. I keep it. <laughs> I love these sandals. You can have everything else, God. I love these sandals. They're, they're, they're mine. They're not yours now. They're mine. You can't even fathom a thing like that. Everything that he had was the Father's. That's the same heart that he's trying to develop in us. There's nothing held back. There's no reserves. Because I, what he said about himself is the same thing he's developing in us. He even prayed this. I and my Father are one. Go over to Luke 17, 10 just for a minute. I'll never forget this. Boy, now if you get this part, you're, you're on your way now. I've taught this, I have taught this many times here, but... <laughs> Really, it's hard for me to te teach Luke 17, these first 10 verses, without going all the way back to Luke 15, 1. Because that's where the image starts. If, again, if you want to meditate a nice chunk of the Word of God, a whole image is Luke 15, 1 through Luke 17, 10. It's all one thing. It's all about how to steward your life for God. Okay? But as he's coming to the conclusion here, and he's talking about forgiving your brother seven times in a day... Even when it comes to financial offenses, where the guy's messing with your money, <laughs> and he says, you've got to forgive him seven times in a day. That was the end of it. Peter couldn't take it anymore. He says, you better increase our faith. <clears throat> and what Jesus says to him for an increase of faith is an amazing thing. So he says in verse 6 of Luke 17, And the Lord said, If you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you might say unto the sycamine tree, be thou plucked up by the root, and be thou planted in the sea, and it should obey you. And now notice, as part of, his, part of his answer to increase our faith, he starts talking about a servant again. Notice, he says, which of you having a servant? <coughs> plowing, <coughs> excuse me. Which of you having a servant, plowing or feeding cattle, will say unto him by and by when he's come from the field, Oh, you just go down and sit to me. <laughs> And will not rather say unto him, You make ready wherewith I may sup, and gird thyself and serve me, till I have eaten and drunken, and afterward thou shalt eat and drink. In other words, a real servant doesn't quit until the job is done. That's what he's saying. Now, verse 9 is the one I could not understand it. It seems so out of character to me. Jesus always seems to be such a gentleman and loves people and nice. <laughs> and then he says this. He says, Does he thank that servant? Because he did the things that were commanded him. I trow not, which means I don't think so. <laughs> no. 
And I thought, well, that just seems, I don't know, it always seemed out of character to me. But anyway, <clears throat> verse 10 says, So likewise you, when you shall have done all those things which are commanded you, just say, well, we are unprofitable servants. We've done that which was our duty to do. It seemed to me demeaning. It seemed like he was looking for slaves now, really. Like, all right, you people just do what I... To be honest with you, it reminds me a lot of what O.R. Carpenter said. You do what I say, boy. <laughs> you, you do what I say. Why? Because I said do it. <laughs> okay? And that's, I was getting that same flavor from here. And, and uh, so I just, you know, what, you, what do you do? You, you don't try and force a revelation. You just assimilate it and read it again, read it again, pray in tongues. Years may go by. Don't try and force a revelation. A lot of times he just can't give it to you. you. You don't have your walls built yet. When you get your walls built, then he'll, he'll give you that revelation. One day I was going through there again. I said, man, I just, just, Lord, you wouldn't even give him an attaboy, wouldn't, nothing, just wouldn't give him a thank you or anything. And I heard him. He said, when was the last time you thanked your hand for obeying your brain? And I, I looked like, I, I probably had the same look you have right now. When was the last time I thanked my hand for obeying my mind, my brain? I'm going, God, I don't thank my hand. My hand, I don't thank my hand for obeying my brain. My hand is just part of me. I don't see any separation between me and my hand, and it started dawning on me. Lord, is that the way you see us? When you say, when you pray that we be one, like you and the Father are one, when we're called the body of Christ, is that the level of relationship you're talking about? You don't see any separation? I am your hand in the earth? Boy, if you get that, <laughs> if we ever get that, you talk about moving mountains. You talk about nothing shall be impossible unto you. When we become his hand in the earth, like my hand is my hand to my brain, and my hand will do what I tell it. Look at it. Isn't it a good hand? Look at that thing. You know? I, faster than, it's faster than speech, isn't it? You know? Left finger, right finger, left finger. I can't even talk it fast. It's, but it's obeying me. I'm going, anyway. <laughs> Victory! Hallelujah! <laughs> when we become, when we, when, well, not when we become, when we realize. How about this? When we have, hmm. See, what would you think about, now see, I'll, I'll tell you, okay, we'll close with this. Here's what the TV preachers are doing. Gary, how many of them are you against? All of them. <laughs> I'm an equal opportunity against her. <laughs> unless, unless they're not lying. <laughs> I'm against all, okay, I'm, I'm for all the ones that aren't lying. Went at offering time. <laughs> Here's what they're doing. What would I think of my hand if my hand began watching TV and, and suddenly against my will, would we'll take my left hand, suddenly my left hand starts reaching for my wallet. And I'm going, what are you doing? And my left hand begins reaching for my wallet and it starts pulling out money and addressing an envelope to send to Zama Zama, a big name preacher. And I'm going, I didn't give you any instructions to do that. And that's going, oh, we need to be blessed. <laughs> didn't you hear what the man said? We need to be blessed. And I'm going, God's my father. We're already blessed. What are you doing? We have access to everything. By... Through his poverty, through his poverty, not my giving. I have access to all my father has. No, no, no. They're training your hand to operate independently of your, of your brain. Really, I said it a different way. They're training your hand to operate independently from your spirit. See, your spirit isn't, your, the real you knows better than that trash. The real you, the child of God, knows all things are for your sakes. Hmm. But they're training you to operate independent of the mind of Christ. When, so, <laughs> she really got it. She got it.
Now, hold out your right hand. Now say, Father, I get this. My hand is not separate from me. My hand and I are one. We have the same motivations. My hand does not have different motivations than I do. Now say, Father, I am your hand. I don't have any different motivations than your motivations. I'm your hand in the earth. Do with me as you will. You're on your way to greatness in the kingdom. Is that good stuff or what? Hallelujah. Ah, good stuff. I got, I, I got to go pray now. So. <laughs> See, and the desire to do it can be there. But you don't, desire alone is not enough. There's a transformation process. And I thank God for the day we walk through the doors of this church to start learning how to do it. I thank God for what we call the message. And all of those things, that's only for the doers. A lot of hearers, a lot of hearers. But doers are going to get there. Amen? Did you get anything out of that? Hallelujah.